Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome uh, along here tonight to, to the theatre uh, to listen to what we have to present to you regarding the redevelopment of the Eden Hospital. I uh, appreciate you taking the time and coming out. So my name is Andrew Weir. I'm the chairman of the Southern Partnership Group, uh, which has been appointed by the Minister of Health and the Minister of Finance to oversee the redevelopment. Got with me uh, here tonight um, Richard Thompson, local, local boy, Richard Thompson, who's one of the uh, Deputy Commissioners, former member of the District Health Board here, and he's one of the members of the Southern Partnership Group. We've also got um, representatives from the Ministry of Health, John Hazeldine, who's the Chief Advisor of DHB Planning and Funding, and Michael Hundleby, uh, who's the Director of Critical Projects. Also very pleased to have uh, the Commissioner, Kathy Grant, and the Chief Executive, Chris Fleming, and I'll shortly be asking Kathy to introduce uh, some of the other members of the DHB team. I've been asked to uh, deal with housekeeping, so uh, a couple of formalities. There are three emergency exits here, one directly behind me. Um, don't run me over, I'm in a rush to get out, I'll run it first. There's two more out the back. And I think there are toilet facilities again out through the doors in which you, you came. So tonight uh, we're going to have a short presentation. There'll be some slides, but really we're going to uh, be talking to them. Um, I'll be giving a, a, a discussion around the work of the Southern Partnership Group, the work we're doing, where we've got to to date, and where we're going in the future. And uh, Chris and, and Kathy will talk to you from a district health board point of view and, and the, um, what it really means for the local community. And then what's really important to us is that we have the opportunity to answer any questions that you might have. So we're going to work through the presentation pretty quickly if we can because um, we need to wrap this up pretty much around 7 o'clock. So um, I might just, before getting underway and asking Cathy to do any introductions, I thought I would just tell you at the outset that if you are here tonight, to hear where um, the hospital may end up being located. I'm really sorry because you're going to be disappointed. And it's not because we're trying to be tricky or we're hiding things from you. We actually don't know yet. We've still got more work to be done. But I'll talk through with you later the process that we've gone through and why we're not yet in that position, but when we, we might. But I just did want to be upfront and tell you that right now. Um, we're not hiding anything, we're not being tricky. We'll tell you everything that we know up to this point. But Kathy, would you mind um, introducing your PhD speaker, please? Thank you, Andrew. And can I extend a very warm welcome to you all on behalf of the Southern District Health Board um, and take the opportunity to introduce uh, the DHB team uh, this morning. We've got uh, this evening we've got uh, Richard Thompson, um, who uh, Andrew has previously introduced to you, Graham Crombie. Uh, sorry. I'll try again. Is that any better? No. Use that one here. I'll try. <laughs> that, is, that is certainly working. Uh, and so we have uh, Richard Thompson and uh, Graham Crombie, um, our Deputy uh, Commissioners, uh, Chris Fleming, uh, our uh, Chief Executive, uh, Dr Nigel Miller, um, the uh, Chief Medical Officer, Dr David Perez, uh, who chairs the Clinical Leadership Group, and Sam Tangil Martin, who is the uh, Program Manager uh, for this project. Uh, can I also extend a particularly warm welcome uh, to Stephen Willis, the uh, Chief Operating <coughs> Officer from uh, the University. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, a, we have a, a, a number of representatives uh, from the uh, Dunedin City Council, including elected councillors uh, and members of the executive team. Uh, and uh, local members of parliament, welcome. It is encouraging uh, to have these uh, stakeholders and representatives of the wider community uh, with us this evening. The rebuild of our hospital is an exciting opportunity uh, for Dunedin. It's the opportunity uh, to put in place a modern healthcare system that will meet the needs of this uh, community for the next 40 to 50 years. 
years. The project has sometimes been described as delay plagued, um, but this evening does provide us the opportunity uh, to share with you uh, the time frames, the way in which those time frames have been shortened, um, and assure you that we are moving at pace uh, for what is a project of significant uh, magnitude. Our balance, we need to balance uh, the timing and getting it right. So I look forward to uh, sharing uh, some further thoughts with you uh, during the course of the evening. Uh, thank you, Kathy. So look, we'll, uh, we'll get underway with the presentation now. Uh, we've done the, done the welcome and the introductions, uh, and we've talked about the presentation and the questions. So who is involved uh, in this project? So as I said, I, I chair the Southern Partnership Group. Uh, we're a group of five. So in addition to Richard Thompson, uh, we have uh, Andrew Connolly, Margaret, um, <coughs> sorry, Tony Lanigan, Andrew Connolly, and Margaret, whose name is Wilshire, of course, I don't know why I'm thing. Thank you. So uh, between us all, we bring a, um, a, a, a range of senior uh, clinical experience, uh, governance roles and other DHPs, and building experience, including some of the partnership uh, group members being involved in the $1 billion hospital developments underway in Canterbury. Now, in terms of DHP uh, representation and input, the District Health Board has a range of advisory groups in place uh, to review the issues and uh, more importantly, come up with the solutions. For example, there is the clinical leadership uh, group. It's there to ensure that the redevelopment fits in uh, with the local clinical service needs. There are also 13 separate user groups for specialties like health of the older people, general surgery, orthopedics, etc. And they are focused, and focused on looking at how to deliver services in their respective areas. And they are also going to be very heavily involved when we get to the physical design phase and we'll have input into the layout of the new facilities. Given the scale of the project and the, and the very tight time frames, we've also contracted external consultants uh, to assist us and we have Safari Research Group, CCM Architects, Jacobs and Johnstar, uh, who are working with us to, uh, to write up and develop the uh, business cases that we have. And, and acknowledge their presence um, here tonight as well. But really importantly, there's also you, the people of Dunedin and the southern region um, who are or potentially will be users of, of the healthcare facilities here. Over recent times, there's been extensive public consultation on the Southern Strategic Services Plan and the Southern Futures Commissioner listening sessions. And I want to assure you that all of that work has been fed in the work of the Southern Partnership Group regarding the redevelopment of the hospital. We've also done a number of patient journey workshops uh, and we will have more patient input as we get into the design phase. I'm delighted with the, the number of people that have turned out tonight. This really is encouraging and I would certainly um, intend to have more forums of this nature to keep you informed as we hit key milestones uh, on the project. We also recognise that we need to work very closely with other key stakeholders. Uh, and we work, for example, with the Dunedin City Council, uh, University of Otago, the Medical School, Well South PHO, the Rural Hospital Trust, and other key parties that are going to be very important to helping us achieve what is actually a really exciting once in a generation opportunity uh, to develop a pretty special hospital. <coughs> So, what are the issues? Um, taxi driver that drove me today, he knew that the, the clinical services block is uh, no longer fit for purpose. It's um, past its use by date. He put it a lot more clearly, but I won't guess those words. <laughs> um, but it's more than just that. Uh, it's uh, more than just the clinical services block. We are looking at all of the other buildings uh, on the hospital sites here in the Needham. And we're asking some pretty tough questions. 
about whether or not they can be and should be relifed. Should we be refurbishing them and investing money in facilities which in some cases are already decades old? Or should we be looking to start from scratch? So some of you will be wondering why it's taken so long. It's because we're actually approaching this in a pretty thorough way. And one thing that's not going to happen is we're not going to build a like-for-like -like hospital because that would be pretty dumb. Uh, those facilities were designed and built 40 or 50 years ago and technology uh, and the way healthcare is delivered has moved on. So we need to look at um, what changes will be happening to healthcare practices and we want to build a facility which is future-proof. We want this to serve the Southern community for the next 40 or 50 years. We know that technology is changing rapidly and we want to do our best to try to plan for that and create facilities which are flexible. Many of which, you know, these new technologies, we don't even know about yet because they haven't been invented. Only a few years ago, nobody had heard of Airbnb or Uber or Amazon. And so even by the time this new facility is in place, chances are there will be a whole lot of new technologies out there that mean that healthcare services will be delivered differently. So that's a real challenge, and uh, we're doing our best to make sure that whatever we do can be adapted on the way through to keep up with technology. The other thing is that throughout New Zealand, um, healthcare services are increasingly being delivered closer to home. It's outside of the hospital setting, in the community, given by primary care and community uh, providers. The days of when many of us would have been born in a hospital, our tonsils out in the hospital, got patched up when the horse kicked us, when we got sick in our older age, we went and spent months in the hospital. In our older age, we went to hospital and spent our last years or months or days and died in the hospital had long gone. The healthcare services of New Zealand now are not all centred on the hospital. The hospital is a very important part of it, but only one component. So we take all of that into account as, as well. We've also looked at how the southern population is changing. And we know that the population is certainly aging, but the growth of the population in the Leeds is slow, unlike Central and Lakes, where it's moving quite fast. So that's another factor. So where are we at in answering all of these key issues? We've done the population analysis. Uh, we're currently having a good look at the facilities uh, that are currently in place to determine whether they can be and should be relifed or whether we need to replace more than just the clinical services block. The ward block, for example, is increasingly showing challenges uh, that we need to seriously consider, and that's another big component of the current hospital site. Very importantly, the DHB staff are looking at what services should be delivered at, in the hospital and what can be provided in different ways, especially in primary and community care. That's another factor that we need to take into account. But I do want to make it very clear that this project is about investing millions of dollars in the Southern Health System and delivering services that are smarter. So it's not about taking services away. It might be about providing the services differently but it's not about taking services away. So with all that in mind, what are we actually building? Well, the good news is that the government has given the green light for the redevelopment. I know there's been a long history here, I'm reminded of it quite frequently, but actually things are underway now, and I see it every time I walk through the hospital facilities that the staff are getting excited about this opportunity. So the green light's been given, for now, there's a holding figure of $300 million as the potential cost, and that's based on some estimates taking into account what's happened in other regions around New Zealand. But it is only a holding figure. And until we decide what we are going to build and where, we actually don't know the final figure. But the fact that that's an initial estimate just confirms to you that this is a big project these are big dollars and we've got to get it right. We could do a fast hospital, but actually what we want is to do an excellent hospital. The bad news though, is that 
developments of this nature typically take seven to ten years to plan, to design and to construct. So we are looking at a lengthy time frame. But to put that in some perspective, I've been reminded that the current ward block actually took ten years to build. And what we are wanting to do is build something which will last at least 40 or 50 years. So putting it in that perspective, still a long time, seven to ten years, but uh, it's what we're going to have to do. We could have you know, gone and bought an out-of-box hospital um, prefab modular thing like they do sometimes in Australia and elsewhere in the country, and it would have been a hospital, but it wouldn't have been the hospital that Dineen in the southern region deserves. We want one that fits the local needs. So where are we at in that, uh, in that timeline? A lot has been done. I know, you know no concrete been poured yet, and um, we're still a long way from that, but an awful lot of work has been done. We've worked through a long list of options, taking account of um, all of those things I referred to earlier about how healthcare is delivered, changes in the population, and we'll be narrowing that down to a short list and presenting an indicative business case to the ministers in the middle of this year for their approval. As a recognition of their commitment to fast tracking this process, they've agreed that we can keep moving uh, on the next phase of it, pending their approval, so we're, we're overlapping what would um, ordinarily take longer. And we'll be moving towards having a detailed business case with a preferred option to go to the ministers in the middle of 2018. Um, that means, I guess, by the time we get on to um, designing um, and contracting, finding construction companies, that will be the early 2020s when we begin constructing a new facility. Now, what you all want to know, and I'd actually quite like to know as well, make our life a lot easier, but we're not at that point, is where are we rebuilding or redeveloping? And so there are a range of options. Obviously, we've got a current hospital um, centred conveniently in the middle of the city, and so that's, that's obviously a starting point, and that is a contender. If we decide that it's worth relighting the ward block, given that we know we already have to replace the clinical services block. As I said earlier, the uh, condition reports that are starting to come to, through to us are challenging that option and it may become yet that that is just too hard. So another option would be to uh, build on an adjacent site so that we can still utilise some of the uh, buildings and facilities that are available on the current site. So that is also in the mix at the moment. If the wood block isn't to be relighted, however, then other options do become more viable. And having services delivered from a number of smaller sites across the Dunedin is another option, as is starting from scratch and moving all facilities and services to an entirely new location. That could be a new location in terms of the district health board, or it could be, for example, the Wapari site that it has already landed. But all of those are options, and at the moment, um, the fact that I presented in that order doesn't uh, give any indication of the priority of where we might fall. In the next few months, we'll be narrowing it down, and there will be a short list still that will form part of the bigger business case. So what's going to determine how we narrow that list down? Very important is the staff and the patient experience. We want services to be designed around the patient, we want to improve flow and coordination uh, of the patients who flow through the system. And we want to create a good working environment for staff. We also want to ensure that uh, the building is fit for purpose and that it minimises risk and harm. So we want to design that it means that there will be fewer falls and fractures and things that come from that. We want the um, best possible design in terms of infection control. We've got to take into account um, risks of flooding, tsunamis, seismic risks. So safety is very important. I said before we want a flexible um, building that will be able to be adapted to the future healthcare needs and trends. 
It's actually got to be achievable, no matter what we might wish for, can we actually deliver it? And again, that creates some challenges on the current site. If we were to rebuild that, we still have to maintain uh, services on that site and just you know, reflect on the thought of having a cataract operation happening on your eye while there's piles being driven in a building next door. So potentially, the program could be extended and could be more costly in terms of time, but it does remain an option. So the achievability, what can we actually do and what can we do in what time frame is also an important factor. No surprise, it's got to be affordable. Despite what you might think, bigger isn't always better, but actually neither uh, always is a cheap initial cost the right solution because sometimes by cutting corners and getting a cheaper option up front means that you pay the price longer term because of inefficiencies and the lack of flexibility. So being able to afford it will be important and of course it's got to be paid for and while we uh, expect it's likely that the government will pay the upfront capital costs, the cost of that finance does become a charge to the local district health board and uh, the greater that ongoing capital charges, uh, the more difficult it is for them financially in terms of investing in healthcare services. Or in an extreme case, if it's too big having to restrict frontline services. So affordability and finances are another really important consideration. But that's really where um, the Southern Partnership Group has got to at the moment. Um, I hope you appreciate that a lot of work has been done by a lot of people. Um, there's a lot more to be done and you know, I will be back and share with you um, further uh, presentations like this and I'm very happy to take questions at the end of this forum but I'd like now um, Chris Glenn, the, uh, can I say, the, the very newly appointed Chief Executive having been interim or acting Chief Executive for a period uh, to talk to you about what it means from a uh, service delivery perspective. Thank you. Thanks for that, Andrew. Um, I'll try this microphone and hang out the back there. Right, so thank you um, and welcome um, as introduced by Chris. Um, uh, particularly tomorrow is my first formal day as a permanent chief executive. Um, and um, I'm here to talk to you from a slightly different perspective in terms of um, being responsible for leading the organisation over the next coming years. Um, in fact, um, some people have asked me questions about um, you know, what why did you choose to um, uh, put yourself forward um, when approached about um, taking on the permanent role? And this opportunity is one of the key elements around what we have. We've got an opportunity to uh, do something which is really once in a generation of making sure we get it right. And we've already talked about um, the current state of the building. You know, the physical infrastructure, even if the current configuration of the building is um, the um, uh, the strength of the buildings, everything um, was perfect. This, what we would, what we would not build, what is there currently uh, today. Um, you know, simple, simple example. We've got a pillar in the middle of my office. Well, that's fine for administrative spaces, but when it's a theatre or when it's a clinical space, you know, we need the flexibility to be able to um, make sure that we have future-proof services. Um, I see a young chap here. Um, this guy might be one of our future doctors or one of our future um, senior clinical leaders and many of the future clinical leaders, sorry? We're very hard to hear. We can't see you either. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is me. Um, is that better? Uh, so wave your hand if I take the microphone further away. Um, we need to recognise that actually a lot of the health professionals that are going to work in our facility um, that we are building are at school now or are at university now. And a lot of the jobs that are going to be delivered within these facilities haven't even been invented. Um, both with the use of the technology um, and also with the advances of, of medicine um, and some of the things that you used to have to fly to Christchurch or Auckland um, for that is now provided in primary care. And that's going to carry on happening over time. We also need to have a greater strengthening of the collaboration between general practice communities, health providers, and other sectors. Uh, there's a lot of focus on, um, on intersectoral activity, the number of people we have driving up driveways and families 
and not linking the different health systems together? How can our facility planning and the way we configure services across uh, both the Dunedin community and the wider Southern District uh, help to facilitate getting uh, better services to our people and also better value for money in what we deliver? The advances in technology. Now, one of the simple ones that we're rolling out at the moment is um, we've got way too many um, patients driving from rural settings to come into the need for clinic appointments, often very short clinic appointments. We also have um, highly skilled, um, expensive clinical resources driving across the district when actually advancing the use of telemedicine um, and where that technological side of things are going to go. And one of the limitations in our current facilities is our ability to be able to retrofit uh, for future technological advances. And so when we're building these facilities, we don't not only need to build them uh, for the technology that exists today, but also for the technology that is yet to be invented. And of course, um, the linkages with education providers. And you know, education providers are a critical uh, part of the health system. Ironically, speaking to the, the Progress Councillor, you know, um, teaching and research and education isn't overtly something that's in our legislative responsibility as a DHP. But could you just imagine healthcare um, if we didn't support and didn't integrate our services in terms of all those three aspects? And so whatever the solutions are, they need to enhance and promote the relationships with our academic providers, and particularly in this um, community, uh, we're quite proud of the linkages and the relationships with the uh, University of Otago, um, the, the Otago Polytech, and of course the Southern Institute of Technology in the southern part of our catchment. Um, planning, uh, we've heard, um, we've, um, uh, Andrew um, articulated the various options, and of course, you know, that is the easiest thing for us all to jump, uh, easiest thing for us to jump to. But the challenge um, about getting ready for the new hospital and reorganising our services. If we just keep going the way we are, allow the building project to happen, what we will find is that you won't fit with the demographic challenges and with the way healthcare service delivery is changing. So we actually have, even though it's still a number of years away from the commitment, from the um, opening of the new facilities, we have to make this start making the changes to how we're delivering healthcare services today in terms of the sustainable system and actually on keeping people well out in the community. We need to make sure that um, we're, we're developing things that are flexible to make sure that we change with the future. Uh, the disruption to the current services. Um, look, I've, um, you know, I used to be um, work at um, County Monica, a little more hospital. Um, I, rem I still remember when uh, the ice and got flooded by workmen who were working up a couple of floors up um, in the disruption that. Um, working in, in, in real life buildings while there are clinical activity going on, um, significant issues and challenges. And so we have to plan for that because over the time period of now up until the new commi the commission is being, you, you demand and you deserve health services to be continuing to operate um, at the quality, at improving the quality and at the level that they are provided. Uh, we need to look at the workforce, um, the workforce requirements. Um, to make sure we're changing, uh, changing our requirements to meet the community needs. You know, when I started in healthcare 25 years ago, there was a doctor, a nurse, and a few allied health people. Um, now there's nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, there's advances in, in allied health, uh, in the allied health professions. Uh, there's different layers and levels, and we need to make sure that we continue to develop that workforce with our educational providers, and making sure that. Um, we have the facilities not only that are fit for the next 40 to 50 years, but one of the challenges we actually also are tasked with is that um, we need to be able to make sure that we have a logical pathway of when the cycle repeats itself again, that there are viable options and solutions um, around where and how we would deal with that. We also need to re recognise you know, the changing makeup of our community. And one of the things that really interests me in, this, um, in the Southern District is that we um, I think we are the only microcosm of New Zealand uh, contained within one, one um, on the map that might look, um, uh, look small relative to the proportion of New Zealand. It is the largest geographical DHP in the country. Um, no other population of 350,000 has 
the, the sized populations at um, Dunedin and Invercargill. Um, they're both relatively inefficient population sizes for contemporary health services, but for geographical demands um, and the challenge of that place, we must provide services in both locations. Uh, we've got the ageing, we've got a stable, steady, slightly declining, slightly increasing population in the, the majority of our catchment. And then we have the rapidly expanding um, catchment in the Central Lakes area. And, and we've got all those challenges about how we can fit our services across here. And if we get the need and wrong, we screw up the rest as well, uh, because they are all so interrelated. Um, so the people that live in Dunstan need to be just as concerned about the service delivery and the development of Dunedin as the people that live right beside the hospital here. Um, we have to, the, the opportunity around strengthening the collaboration of general practice, community health providers and other sectors. Uh, when Andrew showed the, the, the picture that everybody likes to jump to, which is the options, we had a sort of a distributed site. Why do all the health services why do all the outpatient services, why do you have to come to the hospital for all of those? Now, there are some that obviously you need to come to where the high tech equipment is and the, the specialised equipment. But if we can actually configure and plan services in a way that works for both our staff and also for the community, um, why can't we provide some of those um, in, a, in a more distributed way? So we need to have the challenge and the, diet, the discussion with both our staff and also with the community about how that could uh, about how that could be. Um, we also need, one of the things I like about um, the concept that we have here between the DHB and the partnership group, I love having the concept of being challenged by skilled, knowledgeable people in terms of the partnership group around where we're getting. Because we need to be put, um, if we are not stretching and challenging each other far enough, then we're probably going to let each other down. I'm going to let you down. Um, if it was really, really easy to make all the answers on these, um, then uh, there would be something wrong because you know health resources are always going to be constrained, and we have to have that tension to make sure we get the best value for money out of what we build that we don't overbuild. Why shouldn't we overbuild? Why don't we just have a big massive facility and, and overbuild? Because if we have a big massive facility for every um, for all the dollars we invest in that facility, that's less resources that we have available for providing the services to dinner. So we need a, a good tension within that. Um, so what will it mean for you? Um, one of the bits that really irritates me in my social life, uh, when I talk to people about, um, I'm not sure it's it. Sorry, when I talk to people within my social life about my role, um, they'll say, oh, you're the chief executive of the hospital, aren't you? Um, and I get really irritated about that because I'm not, um, it's not a district health, it's not a district hospital board, it's a district health board. And one of the things that we want to have um, configured and structured in the, in the um, how we configure the services is that the majority of services we should be providing in your home and close around your home, um, the majority of us throughout our life interact with primary care and community care providers and periodically go to the hospital for, for our health care. We take the health system around, wrapping around as many services at home, whilst knowing that you have the confidence that when you need access to emergency services, those services are there and are ready for you, and that the hospital is appropriately configured to meet the needs of our community. If we focus all just on the hospital and none on the community and none on developing primary care, um, we won't have the best outcomes for you, um, and vice versa. So um, I really encourage you um, to challenge yourself about how do we um, have, make some of those tough decisions and tough challenges over time within the community. I'm going to now hand over to Kathy. Right. I'll be happy to take this away too. <laughs> And since the Commissioner team was appointed by the Minister of Health in June 2015, our key challenge has been the reshaping of health services 
within the southern district. We need a health system which is going to be both clinically and financially uh, sustainable. Now that, as you will well know, is a significant challenge. And it is not one that we can do in isolation. There are other key stakeholders within these communities who have an important uh, part to play in, in, in that work. And so we are working collaboratively uh, with the Dunedin School of Medicine, with the University of Otago, with the Polytechnics uh, within the region, and with the PHO. We are also working with a range of other providers, uh, our rural uh, trusts and hospitals, and a range uh, of providers and communities. So if we just think for a moment about what our communities have shared with us, what have our communities told us about the future of healthcare in this region? Well, the DHB undertook a couple of listening weeks uh, throughout the district uh, during the course of last year in March and May. And we had feedback from about three and a half thousand of our patients, whānau and staff. And what they told us from the community's perspective was that they wanted to travel less, they wanted to wait less, and they wanted care that was closer to home. Now Chris has uh, shared with you the significant changes in demographics uh, in this, uh, within this district. And so those factors, combined with the changes in demographics, mean that we simply cannot continue to deliver health care in the same way in which we have in the past. So how does all of that thinking then um, impact on the redevelopment of the hospital? Well, what it means is that Dunedin Hospital will continue to provide care when specialised hospital level care is required, not only for the residents uh, of Dunedin, but for residents across the district. But what we need to find ways to do is to deliver more care in the primary context, whether our care is provided by a GP or by a community provider, we, needed to, we need to find ways to wrap services around our patients and their families. We also need better pathways connecting primary care and hospital care. And that means, importantly for you, that everyone uh, who is to, uh, uh, meeting your health needs has access to the same information in relation to you. We also need to ensure that there's a quality of access. So whether you live in Tiana, uh, in Invercargill, or in Oberu, you have access to the same services and to the same level of care. And the other point that we need to focus on is that we need to intervene earlier. We need to find ways to intervene earlier and to reduce the likelihood of conditions becoming more serious and requiring hospital level care. So we are taking some uh, steps in that space and in other contexts, uh, we have shared with you some uh, of those initiatives. So that if I just uh, perhaps take as the example, uh, this evening, um, telehealth and moving into that space, which is entirely appropriate uh, when you reflect on our dispersed population. So that, for example, we have uh, paediatric diabetes clinics in Dunstan and Omeru, where the clinician is based in Dunedin, the patient and the nurse are in either location. So that saves everybody's time, it reduces travelling time, and provides care closer to home. So from the Commissioner team's perspective, what is our challenge? The Minister expressed his support for the redevelopment of Dunedin Hospital at the time the Commissioner team was appointed. But what you will have learned um, from uh, Andrew and Chris uh, 
about this evening is that we are not just talking about bricks and mortar. What we are talking about is ensuring that we have a sustainable health system. And as a DHB, our challenge is to take action now. We cannot wait until uh, we move into a redeveloped hospital uh, to put in place some of the initiatives um, that Chris has shared uh, with you uh, this evening. So I'm uh, conscious uh, that many of you uh, will have questions that you would want uh, to ask of us, uh, comments that you would want uh, to share with us.